Hello and welcome to another lecture video. This one is all about the derivatives of inverse trig functions. Um, and these functions, in case you don't remember, are the inverse sine function, I'll say the inverse sine of x, and we can sometimes, or we will sometimes call this the arc sine. We also have the inverse cosine, sometimes called the arc cos of x. And similarly, we might deal with the inverse tangent of a variable, which is sometimes called the arc tangent. Um, there are other inverse trig functions. There's also inverse cosecant, inverse secant, and inverse cotangent. Um, but these are sort of our three main ones. And so what I'd like to do in the way of a summary here in terms of the calculus is just present to you the derivative rules for each one. Turns out the derivative of inverse sine is a not too weird function. This ends up equaling 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And the derivative of inverse cosine ends up being a very similar formula. It ends up being a negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And then finally, for tangent, the derivative of arctangent is my personal favorite. There's no square roots involved with this derivative, it's just 1 over 1 plus x squared. So as with um, our previous lecture videos in material from chapter 4, we're really skipping an important issue as far as I'm concerned. And the important issue, again, is this question of why are these the derivative rules for these functions, for these uh, inverse functions? And um, I think what I'll end up doing after I upload a few more videos to keep us more than on pace with the, the remainder of our online class. Um, after I do that, I'll go ahead and make a video explaining where the formulas for the derivative of logarithms come from and the derivative of these inverse um, uh, trig functions come from. But in order to do well on us in this class, it's sad but true that you don't need to know why so if you've got better things to do, or more important things to do, as many of you might, you should take note that, at the very least, um, we'll, we can answer this question. Um, we'll answer this in an optional video, in a bonus video. But it's optional. To do well in this class, you want to make sure you can use these derivative rules. Just like we want you to be able to know that the derivative of a to the x is natural log a times a to the x, that the derivative of log base a of x is 1 over natural log a times 1 over x, we also expect you and want you to thrive using these three new derivative rules, and at least on homework and quizzes for sure, the other three derivative rules for inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent. Um, sorry, for inverse cosecant, inverse secant, and inverse cotangent. Okay, so let's go through some of these notes uh, to practice using these new rules. And here they all are stated, um, or at least the some of the ones that, that we mentioned. Um, you'll notice that arc cosine isn't mentioned here, but over in these printed notes, 
um, I'll just circle these. Over in these printed notes, we have the derivative for arc sine, the derivative for arc tangent, and they include a formula for the derivative of arc secant. And what's going on over here, if you look at these three rules, these are the new inverse trig rules plus the chain rule. Okay, so let's start practicing this. I think that's usually sort of the best way to see how this is going to work. So for example, 7 says compute the differentiator of the function y equals the formula cosine of the arc sine of 2x. And so this one we can do using a chain rule. Our outermost function is cosine and the derivative of cosine is sine. So that's sine of arc sine of 2x and then times the derivative of the arc sine of 2x. Okay, so now let's use our new rule. The derivative of arc sine is this rule one over the square root of one minus our variable all squared. That's our new rule for arc sine's derivative. Now our variable here is the function 2x. So I'm using a chain rule yet again. The derivative of arc sine is one over the square root of one minus blank squared. The blank is a 2x. And now I need to multiply by the derivative of 2x. So we use chain rule two times here. Okay, so now we're almost done with this example. We have the sine of the arc sine of 2x times, the derivative of 2x is just 2, so I can leave that on top. And then I have in the denominator the square root of 1 minus 2x all squared is 4x squared. This is a pretty good way to leave your answer, but actually some more simplifying can be done. And this is um, pretty easy to do, but it's also pretty easy to forget to do. So notice I have sine of the arc sine of something. That's that first term. And by definition, arc sine is inverse sine. Because these are two inverse functions and we're composing them, these guys cancel. The sine of the arc sine of something, the sines and the arc sines go away, and so all I'm left with from that term is a 2x. So that's just a 2x times a 2, all divided by the square root, 1 minus 4x squared. And so I can rewrite that a little bit. That's going to be 4x all divided by the square root of 1 minus 4x squared. And this is a really simple way to leave our answer. For example, if I wanted to know when this derivative was 0 or positive, this boxed expression is easy to, to understand um, to get that information from. OK, so example 8 wants us to differentiate the arc secant of 7x squared. So again, we're going to need to use our new derivative rule, one of our few of them. So um, let's go and look at the arc secant rule. It's a weird looking one. It's 1 over an absolute value times a square root of x squared minus 1. That's a bizarre one. So let's just remind ourselves of that here that the derivative of arc secant or inverse secant of just x is 1 over 
the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus 1. So for our function, we want to compute the derivative of y with respect to x. And so we do first have to differentiate through this inverse secant function. So we're going to get 1 over the absolute value of that inverse secant function's input times the square root of that inverse secant function's input squared all minus 1. And this, we need to multiply by the derivative of that inside function, 7x squared. Okay, so this isn't too difficult to manipulate or to finish doing. The derivative of 7x squared is 14x. And then I have in the denominator the absolute value of 7x squared times the, that nasty square root thing. But that absolute value of 7x squared, well, x squared is never negative, so the absolute value of 7x squared is just itself. It's always a non-negative number. So we can leave the absolute values off. And then we'll have this weird square root thing, which if we work out will be 49x to the fourth, all minus 1. Okay, so we can simplify this a little bit. I can cancel an x from the numerator and the denominator. I can cancel a 7 from the numerator and the denominator. And I think what I'll end up with is a 7 divided by x times the square root of 49 x to the fourth minus 1. That would be our formula for this weird Com composed arc secant functions derivative. Okay, so before we do example nine, let's try a popper question. So popper question one. Find the derivative of this function, um, find the x derivative of the cosine of the arc cosine of x. All right, is it answer choice A, um, negative one over the square root of 1 minus cosine squared of x. Is it answer choice b, the number 1? Is it answer choice c, um, sin, uh, negative sine of x over sine of x, or is it answer choice D, none of the above. And I'll just give you a nice hint on this one that you can, you can practice taking a derivative of this um, using our new rule for differentiating our cosine, or you can think a little carefully about what it means to compose cosine with arc cosine and see if that simplifies before you take a derivative. Okay, so here's another good example, example nine. It says differentiate this weird function, e to the arc tangent of x plus the arc sine of natural log x. So whoever wrote this just wanted to use all of our new crazy functions, e's and logs, and now inverse functions, inverse trig functions. Okay, so let's find f prime of x. So let's just take this step by step. f prime of x is going to equal 
the derivative of e to the arctangent of x plus the derivative of arc sine of natural log x. All right, so I didn't do much there, but maybe that will get me a little bit of partial credit, right? I'm adding the two derivatives. Okay, so let's fo focus on this first term. Our outside function in the first term is e, and we love taking derivatives of e. e to the blank differentiates to e to the blank. And the blank input there is arctangent x. Now chain rule times the derivative of arctangent x plus. Okay, now for our second term, we have a different composition. We have the arc sine of the natural log of x. So the derivative of my outside function is now the derivative of arc sine, and the derivative of arc sine is 1 over the square root of 1 minus um, x squared, except that shouldn't be an x squared because that's not the input of this arc sine function. The input is natural log of x. So this should be 1 over the square root of 1 minus the natural log of x, all squared. And then, of course, by chain rule, we need to tack on the derivative of the natural log of x. So just a little bit more. Here's finally where we're using our new rules. We have e to the arctangent, oops, I forgot to see, arctangent of x times, and the derivative of arctangent of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Plus, then I have 1 over the square root of 1 minus the natural log of x all squared times, and now I need to remember the derivative of ln. The derivative of that function is just 1 over x. So if you like, you can rewrite this as e to the inverse tangent of x all divided by 1 plus x squared plus 1 over, and I can combine those two denominators, x times the square root of 1 minus natural log of x squared. This evidently is a formula for our original ugly weird functions derivative. All right, let's try number 10. We have f of x equals 6 times e to the 3x times arc sine of x. So then f prime of x, I'm going to be using the product rule here. I'll group the 6 and the e to the 3x together. And so now I've got to apply this product rule carefully. And I have, I think I've done this correctly. Okay, so first piece, we've got to take a derivative of 6 times e to the 3x. Well, the 6 is going to stay put. The derivative of e to anything is just e to that anything again, and then times the derivative of 3x. So that'll be 3x primed, and all of that times arc sine. Then I've got another 6, another e to the 3x, and now I've got to use my new rule. How do I take a derivative of inverse sine? And that new rule is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So we can clean this up a little bit if we want. Um, for example, one thing we can do, I don't know that it's necessary, but we could, we could factor out a 6 
and an e to the 3x out of, ev out of both terms, the derivative of that 3x that I never computed is just 3. And now I've got plus 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And that's a pretty good way to leave our derivative. Um, I'm going to make a popper question. I guess this will be popper question two. So popper question two. Um, what is the value of f prime of zero for this example? And I'll see if I can uh, come up with some some good options for you. Maybe a will be zero. That's always a possibility. Maybe b will be negative one. And c, I'm going to think hard about. Oh, let's see. Oh, c, I'm going to say is. Um, 18 pi plus, oh, I don't know, 6. And then option D, let's see, maybe I will do 6. And then option E might be none of the above. Okay, so the reason I'm actually asking this popper question is to is be, is to to point out something that I've really glossed over already um, in these notes, and that is that to evaluate these expressions that involve inverse trig functions requires us to think about trig in ways that we may have forgotten to do. Right to answer this popper question number two you need to plug in x equals zero into our above expression, right? We need to plug in x equals zero. And for most of the pieces, that's good to do. It's not too hard, but this requires us to figure out what is the arc sine of zero. That is, what is the inverse sine of zero? And I just want to point out, if that's a point where you might struggle to get this popper question right, you are totally not alone. In fact, if you actually compare the notes I've been going through with the notes that were provided for this section, I've skipped the first part of these notes where we review what it means to compute inverse sine and inverse cosine and inverse tangent. I wanted to start this video off focusing on the new calculus parts. And um, if you would like to review the first half of the notes, I'll post that as a separate video. I'll just call it inverse trig review. Okay, let's see if there's any other examples we should try for, with some calculus. Here was the one I was thinking of. I might zoom out a little bit. Apologize if that messes up your viewing experience. Okay. Hopefully this is big enough on your screens. Example 11 reads, we're given this function, g of x is this weird thing, the arc sine of the exponential e to the x all over 2. And we are asked to find the equation for the tangent line um, to the graph of this function at x equals 0. So the equation for the tangent line, this is something that probably has been just seared into your brain this semester. But whenever you see these words, we want to think um, of our point slope form for a line. Right, so we need to know, um, we need to know what x1 is, 
and they tell us the x value, they say x1, the x point you're going to plug in is 0. And so then I need to know what y1 is, and that will be the y value when I plug in 0. So I've got to figure that out too. This will be the arc sine of 1 half. And so the y1 value, this is where, again, if you're feeling rusty on how to compute the arc sine of 1 half, just consult the other video that I posted, um, where, uh, excuse me, where, um, uh, gosh, sorry, um, Sorry, I got distracted by something. Just consult if you're if you're getting confused with the arc sine of one half. Just consult the other video I posted for the first part of these notes, where we review inverse trig. But it turns out the arc sine um, of one half is, of course, as everybody would guess, pi over six. So again, feel free to review that uh, in our other video. So now to get our tangent line, we just need this last piece of information the slope of this line, and that will be the derivative at our x value. In this problem, we really need to figure out the derivative of this function at zero. So we've got two out of our three pieces for the equation of this tangent line. We've got the x and y values for the point. We just need to find the value of the slope, m. Okay, so step one, Let's switch to uh, taking a derivative. So where you have g of x is the inverse sine of e to the x all over 2. And the derivative of this function, well, this is, of course, a chain. This is a composition of functions. The outside function is arc sine, right? So we need to take a derivative of that guy first. Um, and if you're... Uh, Watching this video um, with enough energy, I would recommend pausing here and see if you can compute this derivative on your own. Okay, so now let's finish computing this derivative. The derivative of arc sine is 1 over the square root of 1 minus e to the x over 2, all squared, times the derivative of that e to the x over 2 inside function. And so that first term becomes a weird number. That's 1 over the square root of 1 minus e to the 2x, all divided by 2 squared, which is 4, times that last piece that we need to differentiate actually isn't so bad. That last piece that we need to take a derivative of, that's just 1 half times e to the x. Well, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So when it's all said and done, I learn that g prime of x can be written as, oops, I didn't leave myself enough room, can be written as e to the x over 2 times the square root of 1 minus e to the 2x all over 4. It's a kind of weird expression, but really we just want to know the value of that expression when x is 0. So when I plug in 0 uh, in for x into e to the x, I get e to the 0, which is 1. And then I have 1 over 2 times the square root, and this will become 1 minus one-fourth, with a little bit more algebra, this g prime of zero becomes one over two times the square root of three all over two. And so when I simplify that, I get g prime of zero is just one over root three. So that is my last piece, that's m. So we have the three pieces we need for this guy's tangent line. We have the x value, the y value, and the slope. And so our tangent line will be something like this. 
tangent line will be y minus pi over 6, that was the y value, equals m, which we computed to be 1 over root 3, times x minus 0. And we can rearrange this a little bit if you like. This equals x over root 3. So you could write this as y equals x over root 3 plus pi over 6. Any one of these three expressions would be a great final answer. Okay, let's try this example. Excuse me. For this one, we want to take a derivative of this function. A square root of stuff plus 5 times arc sine of x over 5. So this, this one, like a lot of our previous examples, also looks suspiciously weird, but it turns out these sorts of expressions, like this f of x, end up popping up a lot um, in different courses. Um, not so much that you need to remember this kind of formula, but it's, it's not as crazy as it first seems, is all I'm pointing out. But okay, let's just sort of hack through this as a computational problem. f of x, I'm going to rewrite ever so slightly, it's 25 minus x squared, all to the one-half power. And then I have plus 5 times our new weird function, arc sine of x over 5. All right, so let's take a derivative of this. f prime of x on this first part. I'm going to use some chain rule and a power rule. I bring the power down. So I bring that one half down, leave everything inside alone, and I subtract one from that one half power. Then of course I've got to multiply by the derivative of that inside stuff. All right, I keep going. To take a derivative of the next piece, I leave the five out front, and now I take a derivative of arc sine of stuff. My derivative rule for arc sine of stuff is it's 1 over the square root of 1 minus stuff squared. And then, of course, I need to take the derivative of that stuff. All right, so if we were to stop our answer here, this would show whoever's looking at our work that we know the new rules, which is good information to convey, but it doesn't tell them that we can also algebraically manipulate these expressions to maybe simplify them. So for example, um, I'm going to rewrite this first term, 1 half times 25 minus x squared, all the negative 1 half. I'm going to write that as a 1 over 2 times the square root of 25 minus x squared. And now I've got to do the derivative of 25 minus x squared. That shouldn't be too hard to do. Hopefully you agree that's pretty simple, that that's just negative 2x. Over on the next term, I'll have plus 5 over this weird looking square root thing, 1 minus x squared over 25 times the derivative of x over 5. Hopefully you agree that that's easy. That's just 1 over 5. And then I can do a little bit of algebra cleanup here. I can say, hey, wait, this 2 here cancels that 2. This 5 up here cancels this 5 below. And we can manipulate this expression a little bit more. But first, let me write out what we have. We have negative x over the square root of 25 minus x squared. And then that other term over there would be plus 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared over 25. And it turns out, before I look at anything else in these notes, um, I need some more pages. So it turns out that for, for this problem, 
even though I ran out of room, um, we can actually simplify this a bit more. It's totally natural if you're a student working on a question like this, you say, okay, this is as good as I can make my answer look. And I agree, this is a pretty good looking answer. But one thing we can do is on this second term down here, right? I can um, factor out a one over 25. Right, so, I, so I'm going to stay in the square root. Inside that square root, I could rewrite this like this. It's a weird thing to do until you've seen a function like this and worked with it before. But if you just check my math here, that when I distribute that 1 over 25, I get exactly that purple circled stuff. And so look, this is going to keep on simplifying, actually. This is why this is kind of worth doing. That first term I'm going to leave alone. That's the square root of 25 minus x squared. And now this next term, I'm going to rewrite that square root. Give myself some more room to do it. That's 1 over 25 times 25 minus x squared. And why on earth would I rewrite it this way? Well, first off, Notice that when I factor out that 1 over 25, um, I'll be taking the square root of 1 over 25, and so that'll be 1 over 1 over 5 times the square root, running out of room here, of 25 minus x squared. And then that 1 over 5 can flip up to the numerator in that second term. Right, that 1 over 5 ends up looking like this. Okay, what's really nice about this expression, right, really all I've been doing here is manipulating this second term the whole time, but now now, if you look at it, I have two fractions and they have the same denominator. So I can combine the numerators and I will get 5 minus x divided by the square root of 25 minus x squared. This is a great way to leave your answer, but wait, there's actually more if you want to do it this way. This is all just algebra, right? So I've got 5 minus x divided by, and all that stuff in the square root I can factor as 5 minus x times 5 plus x. You should probably pause this to make sure that's all correct. And then I can write this as 5 minus x all over these two square roots, I'll just take the square root of each part that I'm multiplying. And now look what I can do. I can kind of cancel a 5 minus x, right? Because what I really have on top, I'll write this in a different color, I can think about that, that guy on top as the square root of 5 minus x, maybe all squared, something like that. So you might be able to cancel that with the square root of 5 minus x on the bottom. You want to be a little careful, um, but you can totally do this in this case. And so this lets us cancel a square root of 5 minus x and a square root of 5 minus x. 5 minus x. And so what we're left with is the square root of 5 minus x divided by the square root of 5 plus x. And since we've been rewriting this problem for what feels like forever, let's rewrite it one last way. I could write this as one single giant square root. All of that was just algebra. The calculus, practicing these new rules, stopped right here. Everything after that was just algebraically manipulating this and saying, oh my gosh, look at how simple this guy's derivative can be made to look. 
All right, let's try one last real popper question before we do some quote unquote fake ones. Um, oh, wait, I was doing these in blue, right? So, popper question three. Um, well, let's say find um, uh, where f prime of x equals zero if or when f of x is this new function, the inverse sine function plus the inverse cosine function. All right, let's make some answer choices here. So answer choice A would be all x values in the domain of the function that is in the domain of f of x, and then answer choice b might be when x equals 0, or when x equals 1. Answer choice c, maybe, maybe um, there are no x values where this happens. So we could say find where f prime of x equals 0 for this function. Maybe we could say there are no solutions, no x values. And then, of course, I'll always give you guys an out. Answer choice G D will be none of the above. Okay. So, uh, let's just make this a nice, clean um, five popper questions. Popper question four will be answer A, and popper question five will be O answer D. Okay, so some of these notes end with some additional questions to try. So you can say if I skip the first two, you can see here are a bunch of other functions I could try taking derivatives of, and I need to use my inverse trig rules for each of these. I also, for some of them, need to use knowledge of E and logs. These first two questions in these try these list, um, these first two uh, are actually more about understanding or reviewing inverse trig functions. So these you might want to look at the um, inverse trig review video. All right, everybody, I hope you're doing well, and I'll be posting more content soon.